Yo, how are you doing, folks? Welcome to episode 13 of the Simple Life Podcast. I am joined, as always, by Mr. Maka. How are you doing, brother? Not too bad. You said you weren't going to ask me this time. You were going to move on, you absolute dick. I'm no, sorry. I'm joking, I'm joking. That was, that's an inside joke for everybody else. I never know what to fucking say at this point. Uh, it's, it's, it's something I stress about constantly. It's like, what the fuck is, uh, have I got to say? That isn't just a fucking repetition of, you know, last week or the previous week. So thanks I for just that, but... I love putting you in the hot seat, especially no, like joking. two minutes into recording. <laughs> right. Anyway, this 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 week we are joined by uh, Peter Crykant, who is a drug policy campaigner who's running for Holyrood, which is the Scottish Parliament, for those who do do not know, to become a member of Scottish Parliament, MSP, for Falkirk East, I believe. Uh, Peter came to my attention in the news, uh, I think last year it was, for his activities for an attempt to open up the overdose prevention centres in Glasgow. This was blocked by the Home Office and Pretty Patel. Ultimately, Peter did what I think any great advocate and activist does, and they go, well, fuck you. And he opened up a mobile site. And since then, has kind of been a big thorn in the side of the Scottish police. Um, so Peter has been very much someone I've wanted to get on this since the inception of this podcast. So without further ado, I'll throw it over to the man himself to give you a bit of background on this, uh, this wonderful tale. Cheers, guys. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for having me. And uh, yeah, you've kind of covered it there. You know, the, the, the drug death rate in Scotland is absolutely through the roof. We've got three times higher drug death rate than the rest of the UK, 15 times higher death rate than the EU average. We currently set at 235 deaths per million people, higher than any other country in the Western world. And we have these ways to, to stop people dying. You know, they're called overdose prevention centres. You know, they're, they're recognised internationally. They reduce the harm caused by drugs. They engage people who would not engage in any form of other treatment to, 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 to actually get involved and potentially looking at, you know, substitute treatments. And, you know, unfortunately, the UK government keep blocking uh, these being being opened, um, but it's the Scottish government as well. You know, the Scottish government have played political football with us. So mm -hmm. I decided uh, to take example from other great activists around the world in places like Canada and Denmark, who have just went ahead and opened these facilities anyway without the the legal framework. And uh, I did so, and uh, symbolically, I did that on International Overdose Awareness Day last year. Um, that was a, a symbolic sort of let's go out, let's save people's lives. You know, we, we've got ways to do it. So uh, the, the, the police and uh, whoever else wants to stop it, they're going to need to, to come and do so. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, it would appear that they're, they've already tried to do so, uh, wouldn't it? I mean, one of the first things I remember hearing was that the Scottish police had pressured um, your insurance company to try to revoke the insurance on the van? Yeah, so the, 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 the national newspaper, the Daily Record, which have been great in supporting the campaign, uh, not only my campaign, but just the wider campaign about drug decriminalisation, uh reported that uh yeah so that was like the the sneaky first attempt i suppose to to get us closed down before we even actually started mm -hmm. um they, they, the police authority contacted the insurance company and then of course the insurance company cancelled the policy because they the you know they said that you just couldn't insure based on the the purpose of the van, you know, and I, was, I had obviously been highlighting why the, the van was being kitted out and, and what it was being kitted out for. So um, I had to get another insurance policy, which increased the costs massively mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I, I having, having a policy cancelled, obviously, another insurer coming in to actually do that means that it, it, it's going to go up quite a lot. So it, it costs me 10, 10 times as much to ensure the overdose prevention ban as it does to ensure my own car. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Uh, and then obviously subsequently, I uh, believe that you, you, you opened up and you were, you were, you were functional. Um, and 
is it police police then targeted the the consumers the people that were using the facilities that you provided the safe injection sites they'd come to search them under section 23 yeah, so there was an, an alleged obstruction charge under Section 23 uh, of the Misuse of Drugs Act. So it's still a charge under the Misuse of Drugs Act, but nothing specifically in terms of actually running an overdose prevention centre. Uh, essentially, what the police wanted to do was get in the van to search three homeless consumers, and they, uh, they alleged that I obstructed them in doing that. Uh, of course, uh, it's always got to be alleged. Um, and then when they, they did get the, the access to the, the, the premises, after the after after the it was made sh- made sure that the people who were in the van now let's get this right that these are three clearly homeless people you know they are homeless they're living on the streets uh, after they were given access to the van once we made sure that the homeless people were actually okay for them to, for the police to then get in. Um, uh, uh, they, they proceeded to line the three homeless people up against the wall and search them. Um, so yeah, I mean it's it's absolutely ridiculous. You know what we're we're talking about here is people who are most you know at, at the most probably uh, need need the point of their lives. You know, like uh, unless you've been a and I have been a homeless drug drug user, you know, a homeless injecting drug user, and unless you've been there, you don't know the, the absolute. You know, day to day difficulties that you have just getting through a day. You know, and, and yeah. to, to put these people in that situation is absolutely horrible. I still look back at that video because we we got it all on camera. You know, the the whole event on camera, and I still look back at it and just think to myself, you know, how outrageous that is that that, yeah. that, that people are still getting treated like that exactly the same way as I was getting treated 20 odd years ago you know I was getting searched and I was getting arrested for it for just purely how I looked Mm -hmm. yeah entirely being targeted for it and then they create I suppose mm. that shame and stigma that then it becomes a, a hopeless pit and it's very hard to to climb out of um, yeah. So, so this brings on, I suppose, quite well to the first, uh, I suppose, combination of questions that I really wanted to ask you, which was sort of how and why you got involved in all of this. Well, I suppose it was uh, it was a process, you know. Um, after I moved away from my own sort of period, the real sort of hardcore drug use, homelessness, all that sort of stuff, you know, I got I got a job, uh, uh, you know, just a an everyday job, you know, working in a contact centre. I worked there for eight years, you know, I worked up to management level, you know, like <laughs> where I come from, you know, you've always got a little bit of, a little bit of, uh, woo, and a little bit of we, and you can sell things quite good, you know, I mean, I was always a good seller. Um, I just turned, turned my ability to sell drugs and my, uh, my ability to, to sell insurance. Uh, um, and, and, you know, I'd done that for eight years, then, you know, I was married through that time, had children, I was this main stay at home, uh, dad for, for both my kids you know my wife and I split in the to leave with the first one the second one my wife actually went back to work after after six weeks she, she was only six weeks old when she went back to work and I took a year off and after that year I thought you know I've got all this experience you know like I, I do have like a, a traumatic childhood you know I, I went through some some difficult things growing up you know I, I turned to drug use really really early in life um, and, and I was only a teenager when I started injecting drugs you know so I thought I can maybe take some of that I can take some of my experience uh, you know being able to sort of move away from that chaotic lifestyle and, and have stability in life you know and, and use it to help others but very quickly, you know, within getting involved in sort of getting paid employment to do that, to work with people who have got, you know, issues that are related to drug use, um, I I just saw that the system's absolutely 100% broken in Scotland. And it's, it's, it's broken in other parts of the world. It's broken in England and Wales. It's broken in other countries. But it's more broken here than it is anywhere else, you know, like... Even if we just look at the system we have here to the system we have in England and Wales, it's 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 absolutely disgraceful. You know, it's I mean, people are taking handfuls of these like street street Valium, street mm-hmm. blues. I mean, they're, 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 nobody's got any idea what's in them. You know, they, they, you can get them for as little as seventeen pence a pill. You know, if you're buying them in bulk, mm-hmm. and you know they're filled with a tizzle and all different types of 
substances from one batch to the next they can be completely different they're taking handfuls of them people are taking 20 and 30 at a time yet if they go to a, a prescribing service here and say look I'm taking all these benzodiazepines I'm buying them on the street I really need a prescription to stop you know to stop taking all these illicit ones mm-hmm. the prescribers will just say no it's yeah. like a straightforward no you are not getting a prescription. Just keep take, and that's that's as good as saying just keep taking these these ones that are getting made yeah. in a pill press in Glasgow. You know, mm-hmm. so it's it's, it's frustrating. Uh, you know, and, and just getting people onto like heroin assisted treatment or you know methadone or and getting people to an optimal level of doses is, is so difficult here. You know, we don't look at countries like Switzerland, man. Switzerland have closed down drug consumption facilities because they don't need them anymore. You know, yeah. they have retirement homes where people get heroin assisted treatment, you know what I mean? It's like because it's a medication, you know, it's, it's yeah. people should be getting every right to every medication. You know, it's this is not a drug use this is not drug use or rights, this is human rights. Yeah, yeah, exactly that. I think that once the war on drugs can be ended and we can move to a post-prohibition time, we can look at this with much more compassion and it is a lock and key. So it's all of the problems that are caused with with inquisitive crime or that then lead to homelessness and the stigma that means families fall apart, people lose jobs, and you end up with problematic use due to inconsistent supplies. All of this can be dealt with with a simple piece of paper. We used to have it in this country called the British Way. We were one of the last holding countries to an old way of dealing with this, where any person that had a problem with using diamorphine was given pure diamorphine. It was pure heroin. They were then given clean needles. They were given education and advice. And it was handed in a nice little white bag with a smile. It wasn't in some dark in some dark alleyway where the room has to be lit a certain way and you have to go in and be searched and the procedures. Are, it, it wasn't anything stigmatizing in the way it was dealt with. And I think, yeah, countries like Switzerland are moving more towards that. And as you've, as you've just said, they are seeing problematic use decline massively because people are stabilizing. They're recognizing that sobriety and abstinence isn't necessarily the answer for all parties it's about yeah. providing that compassion compassion and stability for them to have the opportunity to stabilize their lives and for the ones that for some reason can't often most often through horrific childhood abuse whether it be physical sexual mental um means that they will then probably use substances like this for the rest of their lives and there is as you said for their human rights should be given access to this Without yeah. without that persecution, without that stigma or that hatred, mm-hmm. it, it breaks my heart as a as an advocate for drug reform to hear anybody say the the term smackhead because it's the, it negates entirely the human the other side of that needle. Yeah, 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 and we have uh, you know a much wider, bigger issue with that in Scotland as well because we've got this sort of core of people who are in abstinence-based recovery who have really big voices who are, you know, still fed into the, still feeding into the, the, the narrative of the war on drugs that, you know, even if you've had all this trauma, we can, you can be, you know, trauma-informed and we can have resilience to deal with that trauma and we can move you into abstinence-based recovery and you can be well. They call it getting well. People say it's getting well, you know, and, and, and I uh, I think this, you know, we'll talk, maybe talk about this later, but I met with Nicola Sturgeon and the, the new drug policy minister, Angela Constance, and since then, the Tories, the Tory party have been calling for it for about 18 months, two years, a £15 million investment in residential rehabilitation. Now, Labour just called for the same, the, the Shadow Health Secretary called for £20 million for residential rehabilitation. Now, I can guarantee you on Wednesday, two days time when Nicola Sturgeon announces in uh, the Scottish Parliament about what she's doing to solve this because she took responsibility for her overdose crisis or drug death crisis, that a part of that will be a large investment in residential rehabilitation. Now, we're, we're, as I say, we're just feeding into that narrative that drugs are wrong, drugs are bad, we have to get everybody off drugs. You know, and that, that's not going to solve our overdose crisis in Scotland, investing lots of money into residential rehabilitation. Now, I don't argue against it. People want to do that. They want to go to residential. It should be there. It should be provided for them. You know, people should have an opportunity to live drug-free if that's what they want to do. Mm-hmm. I'm drug-free. You know, I don't don't take any drugs, I'm drug free, but I don't, 
say that, that that should be the case for everybody, you know, and I recognise actually for the majority, it's probably not going to be the case. You know, mm-hmm. you're actually going to, if you force people into that, if there's this enforced abstinence and an enforced um, pathway to abstinence, so because so many rehabs will work with one specific pathway, mm-hmm. you know, the, 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 and if you enforce that into somebody, it's actually going to lead to probably more of those yeah. overdose deaths. I mean, you can't ever put any sort of blanket on um, I was about to say individualism. Do you know what I mean? You can't you can't just use any one process for to to, to treat every single person. There has to be con, uh, cont- contextual. In the, that's where I wanted to put individualism in there. Do you know what I kind of in terms of treatment? You can you have to have that, and then, and yeah. being pro choice for use of of you know that whatever. I'm just using that term. Uh, that I mean that that is a, that is a positive step. You know, that kind of way having having I personally wouldn't do it that way either. I don't think that uh, subscribing to somebody else's already sort of um, preformed model is the best way to do it. Do you know, that kind of way. Mm. Yeah. And I, and I think that's the, the concern that the SNP, because it's still a vote winner, you know, and, and we still have this underlying you know, response of people generally in the in the public that, that you know, that drugs are wrong and the yeah. best thing to do is get everybody off drugs. And I think the SNP, despite the fact that the evidence says that the most protective factor against overdose death is being in substitute prescribing. If you look at experiences from other countries that have reduced their drug death rates, who previously sat at some of the highest drug death rates in the, in the, in the world, like Portugal as an example, mm. You know, they they, they, they have a, a high proportion of people in substitute prescribing. They didn't send everybody to rehab to reduce those deaths. You know, rehab needs to be there. It needs to be an option if somebody wants that as an option. But the reality is we've got less than 40% of people in Scotland who are deemed to use substances problematically in any form. They're not connected or in any form of treatment. They're not even connected with a service. It's estimated over 60%. <laughs> You know, if people are, are not in any treatment, you know, that's absolutely nuts. And they're not in treatment because we won't give people the medication that they need. That's the simple reality. Um, they turn up, they ask for medication, they can't get it. So they're like, well, I'm not, I'm not coming back here, you know. I mean, this, it's yeah. funny you, you mentioned Portugal. Obviously, that's that's the, the model that everybody sort of, well, they're, they're more familiar with that, say. Well, I, I yeah. remember reading an article last year. I can't remember what it was, but it said that Scotland was the drug debt capital of the world. And in comparison to a year in the Portuguese model, um, more people would die over Christmas this year, just gone, than an entire year of the Portuguese uh, uh, of using the Portuguese model. I mean, if that doesn't fucking tell you that what's currently in place isn't working and we actually need to open our minds to this i don't know what else will do you know that, I mean, that yeah. is shocking yeah. that is it's insane yeah. when you think about it so well, i think i think the the, pre- the previous points we've spoke on are emblematic of politicians determined to look the wrong way at this so instead of seeing the destitution the suffering the misery the pain the trauma the agony in people they're going it must be this drug yeah it's the drug it has to be the drug we've been saying forever it's the drug so it's the drug whereas people turn to to any substance any form of escapism be it social by by being socializing going to the woods going fishing engaging in sexual behavior engaging in drug taking in whatever it may be that they choose to do we do that as a way to remove ourselves from a perceived suffering in the world some form of spiritual emotional or physical or mental anguish that we can't deal with so the healthier thing to do is most people have a coping mechanism that allows them to, to deal with that and tolerate it. The problem is when you end up using a substance that is then demonized just for consuming it, possessing it, and being part of that community, the more you use that, you end up in this cyclical pattern of, well, you're a smacker, you're a dirty loser, look at you, you know what I mean? And they, they bomb- well, from your direct experience, you'll know that you're bombarded into a position of helplessness. Yeah. Until compassion is a cornerstone of drug policy reform, until there is actually therapy there 
so there's actual compassionate people with exper- lived experience as well as psychiatric experience and everything in between to provide this everything, that whole full spectrum of care that a person needs. And then at the end of it, if they still choose to consume that substance, it should be a requisite of this state to prescribe that, to ensure they get the cleanest access, the most up-to-date education and, and the best that they can get. Mm. So, yeah. so that, that brings me on to sort of my next point, which is something we kind of touched on before with Portugal. So Portugal have sort of decriminalized, no real region has ever looked to legalize heroin yet. We do have Bolivia looking to buy its national stock of cocaine, effectively becoming the first country to legalize cocaine at the federal level. So it's not without too far in the, the realm of possibility for this to be, to be the case. So that being said, Peter, what do you think would actively help um, the consumer base, the end user most, decriminalization or some form of legalized regulation? Yeah, I think um, I think there's there's uh, various different trains of thought on that for me at the moment. I think uh, the, the, we're a million. If we if we look at it practically, we're a million miles from a fully regulated, legalized market. You know that that's a million miles away. We don't. We, I mean, we've got a UK government currently who are completely unresponsive or unresponsive to to even looking at decriminalisation. You know, or, or looking at things that could even be set up that, that don't officially decriminalise drugs like overdose prevention centres. So, mm-hmm. I think uh, you know, we, and then also with legalisation, you know. I, it's easy to think, oh, legalisation would solve everything. You know, they, we have a purely uh, regulated market and, you know, all was great and love and war and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, we, I think we've got to look at legalisation and the whole, the whole uh, from start to finish, you know, and, and you've got to look at the farmers who are currently farming in Afghanistan and Mexico, right? supporting their own livelihoods and the people that are working in their farms right through to the street dealer who's selling you know, cut bags of cocaine on the streets of Glasgow, you know, who, you know, so there's a whole market and a multi-billion dollar industry already in play here, you know, mm-hmm. that, that you're going to disrupt. Um, so I think there's a there's a, a guy called Professor Alex Stevens, I don't know if any of heard of him, but he's a, a professor at the University of Kent and he does a, a, it's, a it's just a 15 minute TED talk and, and it's really great and, it's, and what it's called is progressive legalisation so he talks about you know the, the steps towards it you know and, and uh, I, I think, certainly think we've just got to keep pushing for decriminalisation and the first step of decriminalisation then so they does give people opportunities to get off of uh, illicit drugs and on because uh, if you decriminalise it, more people will and the stigma will be removed, so more people will move towards getting onto safe supply. You know, and safe supply is where it's at for me. You know, if people have got trauma, they've got you know all these adverse experiences in their life, if they they they, they just can't or won't or have ever have the ability to cope with life without. A substance they should be getting the cleanest substance that they can get and should be fully regulated and controlled in terms of delivery and that can happen through decriminalization a lot more than what currently happens through the illicit supply chain you know so i think we've got to progressively move towards that and the scottish government you know you've got i am critical of the scottish government and their stance around overdose prevention centers or have been because I think we could do this. You know, the the Misuse of Drugs Act is 50 years old this year, isn't it? And it talks about, in that act, it talks about in Section 8 about preparing opium to be smoked, you know, and providing a premises to allow opium to be prepared to be smoked and cannabis to be smoked. That's why cannabis clubs have always got closed down in the UK because it specifically talks about that in the the Misuse of Drugs Act. But what, what, I mean, preparing an opium would be smoked. What are we talking about? Living in Victoria, Victoria, <laughs> England or something here, you know, it doesn't talk specifically about preparing heroin and heroin and opium, two different things, preparing mm. heroin to be injected. So there's, there's a legal way that we could kind of move around that in terms of setting up a, a, a safe injecting facility in Glasgow. Mm. But in terms of the wider decriminalisation, I'm not as critical of the Scottish Government because the SNP did vote for decriminalisation at the last party conference. So they, they are, as a government and a party, in support of that. And that is obviously restricted through the, the, the Misuse of Drugs Act not being devolved. Um, so I, I think ultimately, referendum, 
got to come, you know, and then, then everybody from England can move to Scotland. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, I'm, I'm in Durham, so we've been saying for a while that we don't mind uh, picking up Hadrian's wall and sticking it the other side of us. What we do is we'll have all the Celtic nations. We'll that's that's what we'll have the Celtic nation collective, and and we we'll t- we'll take Liverpool as well because their sounds fuck. <laughs> we'll just we'll, we'll, we'll cherry pick like a draft day at the start of football. Because as long as we're not inviting any scousers. So my thoughts on this, I mean, it's it, the quite ambiguous terms, legalisation on one side, decriminalisation the other. Hmm. My, my biggest uh, pet peeve with decriminalisation of any substance is we still leave the regulation and the way the substances are produced and uh, distributed into criminal organizations. Until we organize that supply, others will adulterate it. There will be a profit margin and a motive for each level for them to cut it with varying degrees of things dependent on your substance in your community um, that end up can be incredibly lethal. Uh, we've, we've seen, uh, especially recently with, um, oh, I can't think of it off the top of my head. Fentanyl. We've seen fentanyl in cocaine. We've seen fentanyl, obviously, through heroin supply. We're starting to to see it into <laughs> even psychedelic compounds like uh, 2CI, 2CP, uh, 2CB, things like that. So it, it's getting quite scary that we're not willing to have these conversations. The sooner we can kind of compartmentalize certain substances and have and take that um, full spectrum approach, as it were, of compassion, the sooner we can start to make these steps. Because as you said, the safe injection site programs that have been going off for years around the world, to my knowledge, no one has ever died in a safe injection site. So th- that knowledge versus what, 1,200 deaths in Scotland in 2019 is, is insane. So that, that says to us that the politicians uh, prefer the status quo over the lives of 1,200 people they deem to not be worthy because of their decision, their lifestyle choice to consume heroin. So yeah, it's it's backwards to me. So one thing I've been seeking to advocate and push in my community, obviously as a cannabis activist and reformist, is the legalization of cannabis and the ring fencing of profits from that to fund rehabilitation, recovery, and prescription models for other substances. Yeah. Because these these arguments are not new nuanced to the point of it's heroin or it's crack or it's uh, cocaine or you can have psychedelics or you can have cannabis. It is the basic human right to it. And I think once we remove the, the stigma towards this, then the, the, the sooner we will actually have a better idea of what's going on. Because yes, there are problematic users in all communities, but the World Health Organization's own statistics say that it's about 10% of all drug users are yeah. problematic. That means 90% of heroin users consume so without a, problems, without a problem. And the problem only occurs when they are caught when they are randomly tested at work for it, or when their supply that they get causes an overdose because they've had such a low rate from their dealer and all of a sudden it's bumped up or it's adulterated or whatever else. And then the consequences of prohibition crash their lives, not their choice or their their dependence or their usage of a substance. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think you're, you're, you're right. You know, I think decriminalisation, though, is a start. You know, and, and I think, you know, in terms of moving towards a, a more regulated market, uh, I think we're going to have to start with, you know, what we can get. And I don't think we're all of a sudden any, you know, there's any sign of governments in the United Kingdom going, right, we're going to have a fully regulated, legalised market here, you know, so it's about, mm-hmm. it's about progressing towards that. And I think the first really progressive step that we could get is a, a decriminalised market. It's still an adulterated, you know, supply chain that, that, that we will see at that point, but we will see more people engage in, in services, which means that more people get on to safer supply, you know, and, and, mm-hmm. and they're also at that point still getting it free before the legalised market comes in. And yeah. potentially, you know, you've got conglomerates coming in and, you know, big pharmaceutical companies and control the market, you know, and then prices at some point rise, you know, and then, you know, so there's, there is lot, lots and lots to think about, but you're right, 90% of people decriminalization right away from them benefits them. Yeah. But you've got to take the money that's saved from criminalizing drug users and putting people in prison and locking people up and put that in to support the 10% of people who, who do have issues and problems with that. You know, because ultimately, decriminalization, I've said this a few times, you could decriminalize drugs tomorrow, but it's not going to necessarily help those 10% of people who... Yeah. 
have these issues and problems. The only thing that helps is taking the money, saving, putting that in there to support people. But you're right, stimulants and how to regulate them, transform, transforms uh, book. You know, I've I've read that, and <coughs> I think we, you know, we we can hopefully get there at some at some point. But I just think we we've got to take small steps, keep chipping away at decriminalisation. I think the first thing that we will see, and I will be advocating for this in my own campaign to become an MSP. Um, is that in an independent Scotland with decriminalisation, we could actually uh, also legislate for a legalised cannabis market. You know, we can we can do exactly what the United States have started to do. You know, they've got 15 states over there now with a regulated cannabis market. You know, and we can mm -hmm. we can actually you know use that as a way of of creating money. You know, like taxing and selling at a regulated price. You know, uh, and, and as long as we're not you know over you know, putting, putting it over market price so that, that, that it's not actually making it more expensive for people. And I think what we're seeing from studies that are coming out of the States that have legalised it for some time now, because, you know, the fear around all this stuff is does it create more drug users? Does it start people using drugs at an earlier age? We're actually seeing data that's saying that since uh, there have been regulated legalised cannabis markets in States, that it's decreased mm -hmm. uh, uh, in terms of teenage drug use, you know, before the, 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 the age of legalised use, mm -hmm. you know, so it's the counter argument that, that I think we really need to keep pushing, you know, that not only does the regulated market generate income that can be used by the governments rather than the criminal gangs, it, it can also decrease use in, in younger generations. Yeah, well, the, this, is, this is something that uh, I just wanted to mention sort of for our, for our listeners really is, a great study of thought that's, that's now coming to sort of fruition and proven to be fact, really, is that a lot of entheogenic compounds, or I suppose in old parlance, uh, psychedelics, can can be used to help reduce craving, can actually be also be found, things like Ibogaine can help um, basically reset neurological <laughs> pathways, helping to really structurally, on the neurological level, help with uh, dependency. We're obviously then seeing sort of li lifestyles of people that are then, say, consuming cannabis in a legal, illegal place, are given an opportunity to make money in a regulated market, are given an opportunity to create connection and community. And as one of my favorite authors says, <laughs> Johan Hari, the opposite of uh, addiction isn't sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. So anything we can do to build communities, to build companies, to build um prosperity within the within the, the people mm. is is a good thing so yeah I, I agree that a regulated supply market for cannabis if done correctly and not overly corporatized not overly created for marketing and foreign investment but a domestic market Absolutely. where where scotland cultivated its own had its own medical industry and then had its own adult consumption market the the profits that could be taken oh. from that i mean you're talking about billions in in in, in savings from policing across the uk so in scotland i mean it's still going to be hundreds of millions so then when you look at the costing to NHS as well, because you can create whole industries around treatment. So a big thing that we're seeing at the minute is psychedelic assisted therapy by using psilocybin, the uh, key ingredient from magic mushrooms. Yeah. It's just been voted in in a small uh, county in Chicago. Obviously, it was legalized first place in the world in Oregon recently. Florida have got it on their books pushing forward. And there's 200 regional areas in America pushing for this. This is the start of the cascade for all of these previously classically illegal legal substances to be the gateway coin and retaking a term back there uh, towards recovery towards a better understanding because a lot of the psychedelic and entheogenic compounds they cause this this mass introspection they cause you to be able to revisit your trauma and to actually experience that which which sort of damaged and scarred you that, that has hardened you to the world that then your tool of escapism your your drug whatever it may be um, then becomes the only thing that can sort of pacify you. Whereas once you can kind of identify it, it's like staring into the abyss for the first time. And you go, I was worried about all of this when actually it was this, but you needed that kind of cushion, that safe space. So the, the marriement of these compounds with uh, classic uh, psychiatric therapies for me is, is the future for, for, for recovery. I think the idea of the abstinence based thing, doesn't quite work anymore. There are people that want that, but effectively trying to force people uh, who are dependent on substance to go with cold turkey to me is a form of institutional torture. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, and it's one of those things that's it's always been a difficult one for me because I, you know, I I am drug free now. You know, I don't take drugs at all. I I, I don't even drink alcohol. 
Um, and I live my life quite comfortably. You know, I, I'm married, I've mm-hmm. got two, two, young, two young children, you know, I'm reasonably, reasonably responsible most of the time. Um, so I, but I enjoy my life like that now. You know, I enjoy it. You know, I don't, I don't have to spend money on it, on anything like that now. You know, and I, and I suppose when my life was so dedicated to just spending all my money on, on, on a substance for such a long time, you know, it's nice to have the, 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 the cash and the, the, the freedom of that sort of side of stuff now. Uh, but you know, it, it was, a, it was a, a magic medical roundabout for me for many years. You know, the first time I went into like one of these residential rehabilitation centers, I had no idea what I was signing up for, you know, and I'm sitting in this, this was 20 odd years ago, you know, and I'm sitting in, in this circle um, surrounded by nine other people and they're all telling me that I'm a drug addict, you know, I needed to stop using drugs altogether, you know, like you need to be abstinent and and I'm kind of forced into that for, for a while and, and I'm lucky to be alive because I've been in a few exactly the same sort of models and I've always t- taken drugs again after leaving, you know, I've always came out and took drugs. Um, but so I think there's there's room and there's space for people to, to not take drugs at all, you know. But it should nothing should be forced upon anybody, you know. And if, if somebody's going to a, a, any type of institution where the the model is based on on not taking drugs at all, they should be one hundred fully. 100% fully made aware that this is what this is about, you know, mm-hmm. before you go. Mm-hmm. Um, and there is also other options here where you have these, these, you know, safe, regulated substances uh, as well, you know, which can stabilise and keep you comfortable. You know, I, I think there's always room, as in there, there's room for everything. There is yeah. entirely, yeah. There definitely is. <clears throat> it's it. I just can't help but like wonder what the foundational belief was in in it or in that approach. Nine people in a circle, all fucking pointing the finger at you, going, "You're shit. You're shit. How dare you be shit? Don't be shit. Do you know what I mean? How you can't do this. You have to. You have to. You know, completely abstain from this, or else." Do you know what I mean? You're, you're, there's an element of worthlessness to it. Yeah, now, uh, that might be severe. I don't mean to. I don't mean to speak uh, out of turn. But I mean, I mean, if that's if that if, if that is the, the foundational belief on that. I mean, how can you how can you imagine that that works? You're just you're just boxing people off and making people more frustrated. It's madness. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, it is madness, but I think, you know, you are going back, that's, that's going back over 20 years ago now. I, yeah, I'm think, sure it's changed. You know, that, that, that place isn't even there anymore, the place that I went 20 years ago. It's closed down, no wonder. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, you know, the, 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 there are still similar models out there where, you know, you, you, you are sort of encouraged from the, the moment you walk through the door that this is going to be like abstinence and this mm. is, probably the best solution for you you know that to be abstinent um, and it's it's presented in that way and that's the thing it's like it's never you know it's always for me it's about presenting choice isn't it, it's, mm-hmm. it, you know, it needs to be uh, the, the choice needs to be there from the beginning you know there's this misconception or uh, certainly I think there's been this conception that you know drug users are silly and they don't understand you know they don't they can't make decisions because they're on substances and stuff like that I think that's absolutely insane you know like mm-hmm. that, 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 that people like me are, are, are regarded like that you know because I, I, well, I don't actually put drugs inside myself anymore I'm, I still regard myself as you know somebody that that has a lot of experience in this stuff, you know, like, um, you know, and, and yeah, it's an enforced model. It's like I was saying earlier, we, all this narrative comes from the war on drugs, that, that drugs are bad, you know, from President Nixon standing up in 1971 and saying that we need an all offensive war on drugs. You know, everything's filtered down through that. To, mm-hmm. to, to the to the residential rehabilitations that we started seeing in the eighties and the nineties that were all about getting people off drugs. You know, and there's successful people out there, you know, like there's celebrities like what's that comedian's name? Um that wrote his the wrote the book uh, about the twelve steps. Russell Brand. Oh yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, you know, you know, the, 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 and, and you can mention him because he's public about it, you know what I mean? He's public <clears> about <throat> being an abstinent based recovery, you know, not taking any drugs at all. Um, 
you know, but that, 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 that there's people out there, there's celebrities out there, and there's people with big voices out there that support that. You know, that 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 still carry, I believe, that narrative and that that yeah. that, that out in the background, even though they don't recognise it and they don't know that they're doing it. Mm. It's the narrative is that drugs are bad. We should be off drugs. We shouldn't take drugs. You know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if, have- sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was gonna say, that's the massively obviously perpetuated if you think in films and, and TV in just modern pop culture it, the, the idea is perpetuated yeah, that uh, the, this innocent kid goes through life and all of a sudden tries drugs at a party and then he's, he's on the street having to, to sell his body to, to make it to make his next fix and, and you know it shows the absolute worst possible amalgamation of a hundred different people's experiences and tries yeah. to sell that as the everyday experience of a consumer yeah, exactly. so, yeah, so, so that massively fucks with people's perspective Perception. You've then, as you were asking before about where did that come from, that comes from 12 steps, Alcoholics Anonymous. The, the idea that you have to hit rock bottom before you can actually then, you have to accept that your life is the worst and everything's the shittest, then you can be rebuilt. And unfortunately, Alcoholics Anonymous was founded by Bill Wilson and another, another guy. And the other guy was quite, well, between them, were quite fundamental Christian in a lot of ways. But Bill Wilson had actually had an LSD experiment that he'd undergone, I believe, Harvard, one of the first trials uh, in 54 or somewhere around there, um, for his own intractable depression because he had this kind of just loathing lethargy through his life. Changed his life. He took it towards the individuals when they started building the program, wanted to build it into the program, and was ultimately refused, and it was never added. Um, the research was then done in quiet a few decades later by the CIA, and now we're starting to see that resurface again in private labs in pharmaceutical companies. But yeah, we are the end. There is an end to that because it's worked by like pe- people like Peter, people like uh, Fiona Gilbertson, and people with lived experience that have then gone. You know what? I've sorted my life and I'm comfortable and happy now. But I, I maybe in, I'm sorry if this comes across wrong, Peter. Correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe feel like you owe something to the community that you've come from, or that you owe something to the other people who who you have who you know are experiencing what you have lived through. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, I, uh, you know, I think uh, the twelve the twelve step program is absolutely wonderful you know, in terms of the amount of people that it's supported. You know, and and I think there's there's a lot of misconception about the twelve step program in terms of you know what it's sort of morphed into since it's a, a initial conception. You know, the, I've read a lot of the the, the literature and, and the original literature talks about not having a monopoly. You know, and and, and it's not really based on breaking people down or uh, you know or hitting rock bottom. It doesn't actually mention hitting rock bottom and, and at all in the original writings of the twelve step program. I think that yeah, the original book was written in nineteen thirty four. Um, but what it's morphed into over the years, because there's like 200 of these different 12 step fellowships all sprung up for you can get 12 step fellowships for, you know, shopping and sex and love addicts anonymous. And, you know, there's there's one for practically everything that you yeah. can think of. And it, it, it has morphed and there's been a dilution of that original sort of writings in terms of this is the only way because it actually says that there's no no monopoly on it and it's just about a re, readjustment or and I think that's what Bill W was looking for in his in his acid trials you know he was looking for like this you know psychological readjustment because he had gotten it through through a, a you know a belief in a power or a god and had psychologically readjusted them and that's all right you know what I mean mm-hmm. I think as a society we should be quick quick to see where religious people are right not not that religions right you know because religions are the, probably one of the, the other things apart from the war on drugs that's killed more people than anything else um, but we click to see where where they're right because the teachings in a lot of these are really cool man you know what i mean a really really cool buddhism and religion and all that and the same with the 12 step fellowships you know the tweet the, the actual teachings of it are cool it's, a, it's about becoming you know a nicer person a, 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 and as such you know that i think that the fundamental core of it but we've just it's just lost sight of what it was originally set up for and when bill w explored the acid uh, readjustments he wanted to recreate that same religious, uh, that same God experience that he had through psychedelics, you know, so that other people could get that experience through psychedelics. And it was never enlarged upon, as you say. Um, But there's a space for that. You know, there is a space for that stuff, man. I I know stuff that, you know, there's a space for for all of this. Mm -hmm. But we just need to be mindful that it's not 
an enforced group. You know, nothing should be enforced on on anybody. It's yeah. free. It's freedom. Freedom of choice. Ultimately, is it has to come down to the freedom to choose yeah. to engage in a drug. And if you choose to do that, and there's consequences, there should be protections within the system. If a government is worth anything, it is there to protect its citizens, its lowest and its highest. Mm. And currently, we have what 15 million people in the UK in poverty. You, you know, you know what I mean. When you you start to look at it like that, when you look at what they did with the taking 30 quid to a private company to send out five pound worth of food. To various households. If you, if you look at the the philosophy, the ideology of the ruling elites, you can see why when they look at it and they, in their heart of hearts, in conservative ideology, drug addiction is a choice. You've made that choice. You continue to make that choice. So you suffer within it. And yeah. I think until we we shift that power or we shift that ideology, it's going to be very hard for us to have lasting, meaningful legislative um, di- difference made to this argument. Yeah, yeah, and that's see, that's what I mean. Where there's a space for that twelve step fellowship stuff because the the twelve step fellowship, the original stuff, talks about it not being a choice. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's, it's just a, a a lack of ability to control the substance. You know, there's a lack of ability to control it, and I think at the core, when you get people who use whose who, whose drug use is really problematic for them, it really is just about that lack of ability to control the substance. Mm-hmm. You know, in the twelve step fellowship. Although it's an abstinence-based fellowship, is about recognising that there's a lack of control and allowing something else to control, to, to be in control. Mm-hmm. And psychedelics could be used for that. And the twelve-step fellowship, it's 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 a god your understanding that's used for that. In the medical field, it can be uncut clear substances. Mm-hmm. You know, what I mean, that can do that. Yeah. So it's about for me, it's about being open to all of that, but just being mindful that we cannot, because like you mentioned, Johan Harry, I love Johan Harry, I sent me his book, I speak to him quite regularly and stuff, he's, he's, he's really cool. He hits the nail on the head with all of this stuff, that the opposite is not, it's not being clean or clean, clean and sober as the 12 step fellowships say, yeah. and it's not about being an opiate based re- opiate substitute treatments or any type of substitute treatments the opposite is being connected to others you know because again for me if you look at the core of people who are who are having issues and problems with their drug use most most of the time i think most people are are disconnected from society through this war on drugs narrative yeah. they're disconnected from other human beings through that narrative as well you know so if we create connections with people whether they're on opiates whether they're in two step recovery whether they're uh, abstinent, whatever it is, mm. the connection is the opposite. I mean, I, I reckon the day that you see uh, a post by police on social media, right, that shows somebody that has been arrested for, you know, hard illicit drugs, just to, to, to summarize poorly. If you see the first five comments as compassion rather than dismiss, uh, dismissive, um, you know just instant dismissal or opportunistic you know i'm in here for the joke you know that kind of way because you always get those fuckers and that would be a reflection on on a society in a positive way i think you know that kind of way but how, how do we how do we get how do we get that how do we i don't know i mean i don't i don't i don't see how personally you could actually look at yourself in comparison to somebody that uses any sort of uh, substance or or in any sort of derogatory way and be very confident about it do you know that kind of way I mean how arrogant yeah. is that to kind of go do you know what I mean like I'm I'm alright I'm alright look at him he's a prick you know that kind of way how how have you got there do you know what yeah, I mean yeah, 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 yeah. why does that sit right with you because it, it fucking shouldn't it should make you yeah. worried sorry I think I'm fucking derailing it again but you know you get my point you guys have the uh, anyone's child yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So they've got like this new campaign out. Uh, it's like a video, and every time they see a post or any of us see a post on any of the sort of police Twitter accounts about a bust, we've got to post it right underneath. You know what I mean? To see how it's actually going to do you no good at all whatsoever. <laughs> well done, but not well done because there's not going to be any less drugs in the street tomorrow. Yeah, that's that. The cannabis community in the UK are killing that. 
We have got some great successes. Um, again, shout out to the simplelife.com. You can actually read an interesting takedown of a piece of propaganda that was created by Essex police. They put together this poster talking about how cannabis affects the body. And it was the most trifless piece of shit I've read in a while. It was very poorly put together. I couldn't even find when Googling how they got to their information. So the person that put it together has done this entirely from their own ideology or a very out of date piece of um, text to do so. Because like I say, it's, it's just not the present information that is known about this plant. So again, I agree that we need to see better output from the police in terms of their attitude towards uh, drug consumers. But until we do that, they're, they're only ever going to make their jobs harder because the, the harder they try to go on the war on drugs while our economy is failing through disaster capitalism and the consequences of the, the lockdown, the various lockdowns and the tiered uh, systems through this pandemic means that you're only going to create more destitution. More destitution is more opportunity for dealers in the criminal marketplace to sell more substances to pacify that pain. So ultimately, until we can have that rational conversation at some point within any house or any chamber of any parliament in, in, in any of the countries uh, around that the make up the United Kingdom, we're not really going to get very far. So I think what we're leading on to my next question, we're, we're seeing more, especially in the UK, the police leading the decriminalization movement in a lot of ways, simply through lack of engagement. Is there a a route potentially to go down that instead of instead of going obviously you're going to continue because you're running you're running for for a seat uh, to be a member of scottish parliament but mm. do you believe there's also a tact of, of going to the police to get them to use powers to kind of enforce a de facto decriminalization where they where they recognize that actually a softer touch with work like uh, pe people's with the work like people such as yourself are doing could actually lead to real benefits on the street yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, we're already seeing that happen and the West Midlands police have already sort of started using these like de facto uh, decriminalisation uh, tactics in the, in the local areas, um, diversion schemes, people caught with, you know, drugs, street level drug use uh, being diverted into the, um, treatment programmes. Um, and you know, the reality is that since I've started running my overdose prevention van on the streets of Glasgow, I've spoke to 50 officers, at least 50 different officers, you know, they were monitoring the service to, uh, to begin with, and then they started coming out and like just checking in on us and letting us get on with what we were doing. We, we supervised 118 injections so far, and there's been times where they've actually watched people coming into the van, you know what they're coming in for, They've not bothered, you know, they've just let us get on with it. And every single police officer, apart from one that I've spoke to, has all been in agreement because the conversation normally goes along the lines of the Misuse of Drugs Act. It's so outdated. We, you know, we, we need to change this. You guys, I'm saying this to them and, and, and they're like agreeing with me, you know, and they're like, yes, yeah, we can't work with this anymore. You know, it's just, it's just unworkable. Um, the, the problem that we have in Scotland is we don't have regional police forces like in England. So you've got regional forces where police and crime commissioners can come in. You know they can make decisions with the legal teams in terms of like de facto decriminalisation, get more people in treatment. In Scotland, we have one senior law officer. We have Police Scotland, which is across the board that doesn't get split up into regions anymore, um, and it's essentially down to one man. One man senior law officer, you know, the, the Lord Advocate, it's his decision. And so far, he's just not been willing to address this. You know, he, he's he's pushed back to that the, it's not a devolved issue. The Misuse of Drugs Act's not devolved. Policing and crime's fully devolved. And when it comes to matters of policing and crime, it's entirely his responsibility. He's been directly quoted to say that. So this is a policing and crime issue at the moment. To take it out of a policing and crime issue, he simply needs to say, let's let's introduce non-prosecution stances for people attending DCRs in Scotland. You know, mm -hmm. the police don't have to prosecute somebody. It's the same as 
30 years ago when they were sitting outside needle exchanges waiting on people going in or coming out and arresting them, you know, for, for when they were going into the, the first needle exchanges that were being set up. You know, and, and the changes were made then by the Lord Advocate. Changes have been made by previous Lord Advocate around, Lord Advocates around uh, like uh, non-prosecution around se- sex work. You know, so there's there's precedents being set there. So I think it's got to be the way forward that the police have got to have a a, a, a say in this. Yep. You know, we look at groups like Law Enforcement Action Partnership, Leap. Yeah, who have got branches Leap Leap UK, Leap Europe. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Leap Scotland. Uh, launch yep. event tomorrow, the nineteenth. Um, it's on Eventbrite. If you guys want to join in, it's free to register and come. Definitely. I think that as well. Um, so unless you're sick and tired of hearing me talk, <laughs> not at all. unless you're never. sick and tired of hearing me, by um, nah, never. There's not enough can be said on, around this this uh, yeah. conversation, honestly. But yeah, so the, the police have got a part to play because we've got retired police officers, you know, 25, 30 years experience in the force, mm. telling the government now. You know, this is wrong. We can't do this anymore. We can't criminalise people like this anymore. We've got to change this. You know, we've got to have some sort of different way to police this so that we can support people, especially when you get down to that core nitty gritty stuff, you know, that street level injecting crack and cocaine level stuff. You know, Mm -hmm. people are in, you know, dirty alleyways, you know, getting infected wounds. Glasgow's got the largest outbreak of HIV that the UK has seen in the last 30 years yeah. it's uncontrolled and ongoing and it's condensed amongst people who inject drugs you know there's been a hundred and over 190 cases now and it's it's all in, it's all condensed in this mm-hmm. population which is only estimated to be 500 people it's now mm-hmm. spread it's now actually it's that uncontrolled it's actually spreading now outside Glasgow City Centre and in North Lanarkshire there's been some cases detected that stuff could all be you know, maintained, uh, sorry, eliminated, we could actually eliminate, you know, mm-hmm. the spread of HIV through public injecting and uh, hepatitis C through through giving people safe conditions to, to, to take the drugs. You know, like, it's, yeah. it's it, fucking it, not rocket science. Yeah, yeah stuff, exactly, right? exactly. So, I mean, and you say that it's been 30 fucking years. I mean, you, you've had, what was it? I'm trying to remember the film. Train spotting. Have you fucking not seen Train spotting for fuck's sake? Like, how do you not know that this? <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, come on. For like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's like oh, more of the same, please. That because we know that that works. <laughs> yeah. oh. it, it, it's we, we're in an unfortunate position. I think that everywhere in the world, no politician, regardless of their spectrum or their party affiliation, wants to be the person to truly come out and have the conversation and say, wait a minute. Drugs are going to exist regardless of how hard we could literally spend the GDP of every country in the world and people will still consume drugs. There are regions in the world where you can get your hands cut off. You can get death by firing squad, yet the markets pervade. There is, there is nothing punitive or, or, fe- or any level of fear you can instill in, into problematic and, and, and dependent consumers that will stop them. Nothing is going to stop that. If you have a pain inside of you and you know that the consumption of a substance will cease it, you will stop at nothing to get that. So until we can have a politician brave enough to stand up and say that, we're not going to get anywhere. Um, so actually, this this leads me on to a point of talking about Scottish politicians. Uh, I obviously follow your feed quite a lot and see what you're up to. And I saw that you recently had a conversation with the, uh, the First Minister of Scotland, Nic- Nicholas Sturgeon. Uh, would you mind giving us a bit of uh, information as to what uh, what you've chatted about? Yeah, I mean, I I met with Nicola Sturgeon, but also the new minister recently appointed for drug policy. So um, I think that was one of the most progressive things that, that that's happened in Scotland for for some time. Because previously, Joe Fitzpatrick, the health minister, he was the minister for for health, but he was the minister for public health sport and well-being so uh, one day he'd be talking about you know three people in Scotland dying from a preventable drug death, death and the next day he'd be talking about cricket you know it's like yeah. what's going on there you know so appointing somebody who's specifically 100% focused on drug policy was the first you know good uh, move forward for, for the Scottish government and, and the first the first positive thing that Nicola Sturgeon 
did. Um, and then she also took personal responsibility for trying to deal with this crisis, which was good, you know, and, and, and she and the Drug Policy Minister attended the Drug Death Task Force uh, meeting, which is uh, reduced these, you know, this terrible uh, death rate. So, but in terms of the actual meeting itself, you know, we, we obviously discussed overdose prevention centres. Um, you know, that was what got me to the meeting, the overdose prevention centre got me to the meeting because got me to that point of that meeting. Um, but I wanted to discuss that briefly. Uh, yeah, it was five, ten minutes. Either, you know, the legal framework's created, you talk to them until yeah. such a time. Um, but the, the, the big thing that I spoke about with Nicola Sturgeon was the prescribing procedures. Um, you know, I emphasised and re-emphasised the, the, the fact that you know, the main thing that we have to do in Scotland is get people off of illicit drugs and onto safer supply. You know, if, if, we, if we can't do that, if we don't do that, we're, we are going to continue to see people dying in their thousands every year. Um, you know, I think we've spoke about residential rehab quite a bit, but both the Tory party and the Labour party have called for massive investment in residential rehab. Now, there needs to be some investment because it's not available at all just now. You know, in Scotland, yeah. it's like if even if somebody if somebody says, "Look, I'm I'm sick and tired of taking drugs altogether." You know, I started doing this when I was eighteen. I didn't mm. realise that I would I would I would create all these issues for me. You know, and I, and I want to get off drugs altogether. Can you send me somewhere to detox? Mm. That's not available. So we need that, that availability for people that want to do that. But the biggest thing that we need to do is get people into me, into our medical supply right now under 40 percent so i emphasized i re-emphasized the number one protective factor is getting people into that prescribing um but we'll see uh, so the other thing that sort of come across my mind i meant to mention it to, uh, earlier but yeah uh, completely got sidetracked with another point um, what's the appetite like in Scotland towards sort of drug testing? We did see a movement across UK music festivals for a while uh, with the Loop um, that were based as from a few universities, but I believe it was Fiona Meesham who was at Durham at the time, sort of cha championed this. Is there an, app an appetite to do sort of similar in Scotland? Because it could be sold as an argument, as a way of keeping an eye on street supply to understand what adulterants are there, to understand what the concentrations and the potency of various batches are so that they can better advise the people who are going to consume anyway, because it's, it's disgusting. I saw a, a piece put out about two drug deaths in Durham from a, a potentially adulterated um, supply of heroin. And underneath the number of comments around it, were just don't consume, don't consume. One of the media outlets pointed saying that you shouldn't, people should then stop consuming as if everyone was taking heroin and then going, Oh, well now I know it's bad. I'm not going to consume it. Did you know what I mean? It was such a weird yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a weird, weird way. I mean, I think that, that would go hand in hand with an overdose prevention centre. You know, if we do get overdose prevention centres, we would automatically, I think, see drug, you know, officially a, a, a sanctioned uh, centres, we would see drug testing facilities, uh, drug testing capabilities within overdose prevention centres. Um, you know, we see that in places like Copenhagen and other places around the world, you know, and what we actually see in the data that comes out of places where they have drug testing facilities is uh, the, the, the drugs that people are buying, uh, you know, the illicit supply chain is becoming more pure because the dealers know, you know, that you know, ultimately this person is going to go and get their drugs tested. So, you know, if I keep cutting it with so much crap, they're going to stop coming and buying it off me, you know. So um, it's, it would be great if we had drug testing facilities on every mm -hmm. every street corner you know so people could test it before they take it because it's the ultimately it's the adulterated substances that are primarily responsible for killing people and in scotland it's the multiple substances you know the toxicology reports for people show 45 substances uh, in the toxicology report you know so it's not like it's one specific mm -hmm. it's you know it's often there's street benzodiazepines 814 of the 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 one thing being detected in the toxicology um you know that's usually often mixed with uh, 
a head one, the method one, a lot of cocaine showing up now. Mm-hmm. Um, that's really popular now. A lot of powder from cocaine injecting by street drug users in Scotland. Um, in fact, the majority of injections that, that, that we've supervised have been powder from cocaine on its own without anything else mixed in there. So it's quite an unusual market already. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, drug testing facilities would be great. But again, I really hope that Nicola Sturgeon, when she makes this address to Parliament in a couple of days, it's not all just about one yeah. specific group. You know, it's yeah. not just all about getting people off drugs. Because that, for me, that just panders to that old Conservative and now also Labour narrative that the, the, the best route to reduce drug, drug deaths is to get people off drugs, get people well. Yeah. Sometimes the way to get people well is just to give them what they need. We, if, we, if we can meet drug consumers where they are, if we can actually speak to them and go, what do you need? You need a home, you need food, you need a consistent income, consistent clean supply, safe needles, you need education about what you're doing, you then might need nutritional advice. You know what I mean? If we can build that kind of compassion package, we'll have a, a lot better and a lot uh a lot better of a, of a reaction, a, bit, a lot better of a response, and we would see deaths go down. We would see problematic use go down. Um, uh, yeah, I, I agree. There needs to be this kind of full and broad spectrum approach. Um, there has so to be. To, just read my, read my next tweet there from me. Yeah, no, no it, it's Perfect. true, though. <laughs> it is true, because you think about it. I mean, it, 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 Scotland, Scotland, the, the independence, um, um, not argument, the, the topic of independence is, is quite prominent, right? And if you are, you know, I'm personally, I'm for um, federal autonomy, you know, any sort of, any sort of more, more autonomy that you can give to countries and then just work together. I'm, I'm all for that kind of stuff. But, you know, besides that, if you're going to make a go at anything, like this right it is within your interest to ensure that the the entirety of your population is at the best it can actually be hello young man hey. how's it going <laughs> well i got a couple more questions and it, yeah i can i can make this point another time but but basically i'll just summarize it saying that you know if everybody's healthy if everybody across the board in is healthy then an independent scotland or ireland or reunified ireland or whatever is going to be much more likely than if you know people are still in in dire straits in terms of suffering or in poverty or something like that so you really really you really have to to take this accumulated approach just to sort of build on what the two of you have been saying. That's my point. There you go. Quite, quite succinct there, brother. Quite yeah. succinct. Um, obviously, I'm aware that f- uh, family uh, f- family stress is a calling. So I'll uh, I'll I'll, co- I'll, co- I'll combine a couple more a couple of the questions and try and get you out of here in two or three. So one of the main things that, that's come up time and time again that we haven't really addressed as a direct question uh, throughout this podcast is that there is a lack of compassion. How do we cultivate and create more compassionate drug policies and how do we reduce the stigma around not just heroin consumption, but the consumption of any illicit substance? More compassion around drug policy and reduce stigma. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I think, you know, the biggest thing that we can do around drug policy is, is for me right now, is, is continue to push for decriminalisation. You know, I think that's the, the biggest thing, you know, in terms of reducing stigma. I think if you look at people who do need support, they do need help, you know, especially when it comes to, to, to potentially like women more so even than men, you know, women with children or or uh, parents with children, you know, the, 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 the people are scared to come forward because right now that could actually mean that, mean that their children are removed from their care, mm. you know, that they, they, they lose the ability to, to be parents because of the stigmatisation and the criminalisation, you know, the p- children can be often forcibly removed from their, from their, 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 their uh, maternal homes because of how, how, how policy currently stands. So and and I think if you if you go if we if we manage to get that first and foremost that decriminalisation, people will start to in the general public see this much more as you know problematic substance use, much more as a health issue, you know. And you'll also get um, like Carol Hart, Doctor Carol Hart, recently, you know, he's he's just uh, released a, a book, you know, about uh, and, and within that, he, I think his pushes are around things like um, you know. 
people who, who don't use drugs problematically, but they just use drugs, they need to say it. You know, like people need to come out and they need to support. You know, in terms of the the, the wider the wider issues. You know, because like yeah. we've spoken about regularly here. You know, ninety percent of people who take drugs they don't have issues or problems with it. We need to know about people like that. You know, yeah. they need to come out and support it. You know. Uh, and, and, and that would be a massive move forward and the push for decriminalisation, you know, and, and uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it's just hopefully, I'm, I'm really hopeful that, you know, and this may be that the algorithms, you know, of, of my social media, um, but, you know, I just see so much support in Scotland for change, you know, and so much compassion, you know, and when I... I I done that thing about looking on the you know the social media when you see something on social media you know like the uh, BBC re- reported something around, around fix room you know and I wasn't tagging it so I never seen it for some while but I read through practically all the comments and there's hundreds of comments and there was only a handful of uh, all of these hundreds of comments that were were, were, were like these stigmatizing comments you know most mm-hmm. of them were coming from this compassionate place and for people in society you know and, and I think you know I've mentioned Nixon already but you know again Johan Harry's book you know like we can date this stuff all back to like a hundred years ago when prohibition and alcohol uh, stopped you know they just had to find something else to keep the the, the department running so you know go out and target drug users yeah. you know and you, get, you guys mentioned earlier about you know where this all started in the UK you know, like, well, we had 1,300 registered addicts in the UK, like, 60 years ago, and, and look what's happened since the, the prohibitions really kicked off and the, and the Mrs. Who Drugs Act's kicked in, you know, it's like mm-hmm. hundreds of thousands of people suffering who just can't get help or support now, you know, so... Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know, and I think people uh, at all sides of the debate have got have got a part to play. You know, I think mm-hmm. I think there's room for everybody here um, if we're we're all just compassionate with each other. You know, and I and I, I may have said some stuff earlier and and the podcast that you know, like I have got no like desire for not for the for them not to be sort of places for people to go into these abstinence based recovery rooms. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, Mm. It's 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 got to, everything's got to be available, you know, mm. um, and everybody's got to have the options on the table for it to be a truly compassionate way to, to uh, approach drug use for generations to come. Yeah, I think we've mentioned this before on a, a, a couple of podcasts where you know an awful lot of support can be can stem from us. Um, you cons- consumers, I was trying to search for the right word there um do you know that kind of way so just even from a recreational sense it is very important for for all of those voices to speak out as you said 90 percent that's an awful lot of people you know that kind of way and all it takes is the non-settling uh on your personal situation do you know what i mean what we've alluded to before you know oh i've got um a medical cannabis prescription now that's me sorted fuck everybody else just to be flippant about it obviously they're not going to say that you know, yeah. you know what I mean but it's that sort of uh, surmise mindset that we need to we absolutely need to uh, to move away from and that doesn't cost anything you don't have to set yeah. any system up you really really don't it's just you, you've just got to think about outside of yourself and just tune in to the fact that you know deep down in your heart you do want every other person to be as best as they can be in terms of yeah. of you know health and mental yeah. physical mm-hmm. whatever it is you know that kind of way yeah. so it's in there somewhere trust it's me uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a beautiful point it's a beautiful point um peter then final question i suppose is so i guess what does the future hold for for you for overdose prevention centers in in um in scotland 
Well, I don't know if you guys seen, but we've uh, just recently purchased a new vehicle. Yeah, so, I saw that. Um, yeah, so that's that's exciting. That that's going to be delivered hopefully sometime towards the end of this week. And you know, I think that's just the next step forward. You know, it's an ex health authority ambulance. It's come straight from the health authority. Um, and it, it really, for me, it's a symbolic sort of. You know, this is a health issue. It's a health. Uh, initiative, you know, and, and we're going out to, to help people suffering with a health issue, you know, because they are, you know, people who are, you know, injecting drugs in alleyways, it's, it's you know, it shouldn't be happening. Uh, it's that simple, you know, we, we, it doesn't need to happen. So, um, and hopefully, not too distant future be up and running with an officially sanctioned site and uh, you know, my job will be done then you know, and, and if I can be successful in my, in my run for election for the, the, the parliament you know, I'm, I'm campaigning you know, not as a drug policy campaigner as a, a human rights campaigner you know, I, I go into parliament representing the views of the people who uh, you know, I, I've lived beside and I've worked beside and I'm, you know, in the area that I've, I've grown up in you know, I'm going to say that you know, what ultimately improves not just drug use, but improves society is investment in our local communities and, our, you know, our children, you know, and our education system, you know, and, and, and proper alcohol and drug education and schools, you know, and, and you know, investment in renewable energy and, you know, and making Scotland a truly independent country through, you know, a fully regulated cannabis market, you know, and, and creating a new economy through that, you know. So we we can we campaign or I campaign on, on the basis that, you know, that that's my, my belief, you know, that, that all of the societies else come from investment in, 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 our, in our community and our, in our children, you know, so. Mm. Yeah, per man. perfectly succinct. Um, would you like to give a shout out to any pages or sort of where can people keep up to date with your work? I've just shown um, uh, your Twitter Sorry? and I've just shown your safeconsumptionglasgow.com while you were while you were uh, chatting away there. Oh, excellent. Mac has already done the work for us. You get really good at this. It's only taken 13 episodes. You know. <laughs> Peter, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for joining me. Um, I, doth, I doth my proverbial cap to you. Honestly, anybody that engages in direct activism Thanks, like this, you are you are saving lives. You are making a difference and 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 helping to make a change. So I, I personally, I'm I'm, pr I'm proud to have had an opportunity to speak to you. So and thank I, you. I echo everything that you just said, and you say it better than me anyway. But no, honest, <laughs> honestly, thanks very much, really, because nobody else is fucking doing it. No, seriously, <laughs> do you know what I mean? You're, you're getting hassled. You're getting hassled from everywhere, and you're still fucking doing it. Fair play to you, and you know, I really, really hope this becomes a, a massive success. I really do. Yeah. We'll uh, we'll obviously have you on again in the future as well once. Uh, Fingers crossed, Thank things you. progress Thank a bit you. more, and and hopefully when you do get elected, you yeah. will be able to give a little old show like us some time of day as well. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, it's been, it's been. <laughs> I'm probably a busier now than I'll be as an M as an as a politician to be honest <laughs> more, more than likely true, more than likely true. So I expect to see some uh, some emails in your official <laughs> inbox. Yeah. Right, guys, this has been episode 13. Thank you, as always, for joining us. Um, you can find us on all social media platforms at The Simple Life if you really did enjoy this episode. Check us out on patreon.com forward slash The Simple Life, where for less than a cup of tea a week, you can help keep the lights on at this place. Right, how... I think that was it. That was perfect. That was yeah, great. Do, I'm done. Do. We're Fuck out of here. Peace and love. Get rid of it. <laughs>